With that said, let's begin this chapter. So, we've got, we've got five objectives this chapter, five objectives. So, first objective, we're going to talk about both base units and prefixes. The second objective, scientific notation. The third, conversions of units. The fourth, estimating a value based on known units. And the fifth, using what's called dimensional consistency or dimensional analysis. Those are going to be our five main objectives. Let's start first. The phrase, base units, base units. What does this mean? The standard value for one, one, I put that in quotes, of that physical quantity. What does that actually mean? What does one of a physical quantity mean there? God bless. What do you think, guys, ladies, gentlemen? What does it mean, one of some? Yeah, more. Okay, sort of like a unit rate, I like that. That's usually uh, like dollars per apple or something, but I like the idea. It's getting it down to its base. But what is a base unit then? What is an example of a base unit? How about that? What's an example, Seb, of a base unit? Okay, you're on the right track. I like that, Seb, I like that. Yeah. It's like the lowest whole number of a unit. Okay, the lowest whole number. So one foot, you stop there, and like, that's good. And then you convert to 12 inches, then we're talking about two different units. So, so for example, what do we measure distance in in SI units? Meters, very good. And this is not obvious, not everybody knows this. I don't know if everybody took physical science in like eighth grade. But meters are used to measure distance or displacement. So the meter is the base unit. The meter is the base unit of length. And we are going to really only work in SI units. I'm going to have you do a little conversion with English units also here today, just so you see it and you're used to it. But when it comes to calculations and equations, things are going to always be in SI units. Okay? But I do want you to be familiar with converting like feet to yards and feet to inches or miles to feet with a conversion factor given. So the base unit of length is absolutely meters. What is another base unit that either you know or you suspect you may know? Yeah, Carolyn? Grams. Grams. Now, that's an interesting one, right? Delivery. Yeah, it's the weirdest one. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But the base unit for mass is actually not a gram. It's a kilogram, which is a very, very interesting exception to the rule. Almost all base units do not have prefixes. So for other units, we're not going to have kilo or milli or centi. But for the, for the unit of mass, we happen to have kilogram as our unit. Okay, and that's the mass unit. Again, length, which could be distance or displacement, is in meters. What's the third base unit that we'll probably use a lot tomorrow? Liter. Say again? Liter. Okay, volume, I like it. So for volume, it is liter. We probably won't use it that much. Only because, well, I shouldn't say that. If we get to fluid mechanics later in the year, we would use it, yep. But we probably wouldn't use it earlier on in the year. Temperature. Okay, what are you going to use for temperature then? Celsius or Kelvin. Okay, Celsius, really Kelvin is what we would use. So for temperature, for temperature, I'm going to write Kelvins. And it's not degrees Kelvin, by the way, which is ridiculous. It's just nomenclature. Degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius. The Kelvin is represented as Kelvins. And Rankin is represented as Rankin. Rankin is the absolute unit for Fahrenheit. Yeah. Definitely use these later in the year with fluid mechanics and with thermodynamics and heat transfer. But earlier in the year, there's one other unit I still want to get up here. Very good. Time. Time, which is in seconds. Very good, guys. Well done, well, ladies and gentlemen. Because these are really the main base units. If you look at your text, actually, I think your text states all the real base units that exist. And it's only like seven base units that make up every other possible unit. Uh, does your text talk about the base units? Yeah. So ready for this? It's on page 10 if you want to jot this down. The base units that make up every other unit of all in physics, like if you know electricity, volts, and amps, and coulombs, all of those units come from these base units. So meter we have, second we have, kilogram we have, the other base units that are useful for E and M are current, which is in amps, temperature, Kelvins, amount of substance in chemistry was measured in moles, 
And then something called luminosity, which is measured in Ken Nevels, which is why it's called Ken, Ken Nevels, CD. The ones that you need to worry about in this class are on the book. Don't worry about the extra that I just said. In this course, these are the ones you need. And the last two, only later in the year, you're going to use those. It's really the first three that will give us almost every other unit we'll use in mechanics. Okay? Those are the first three that are important. All right, so good. Those are our base units, one of any quantity. Let's quickly, a little bit of history. Sometimes in physics, I do like to em emphasize history because it is important. All right, we recognize that over time, physics has changed. And if you start looking into the model of the atom from chemistry and physics, you can clearly see how the model of the atom evolved from a simple atom that we thought was just a particle to that plum pudding model, right? The Rutherford model with the electrons dispersed throughout. Then we went to the Thompson, J.J. Thompson model. Then he found out that there must be a centralized nucleus with positive charge. So over time, it, it changed. So we got to the Bohr model. And then the Bohr model is not even really useful at the world. So this is just some history of units. And this is only for length. So to give you an idea of where things come from. So the first distance in Egyptians of length was a cubit. And that was the distance from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. Reliable? Is that reliable? I should see everybody going, no, 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 not at all. How about the second one? The length of the royal foot of King Louis the 14th. That was a foot. Reliable? Unless we, when he dies, what do we have to do? Yeah, chop on his foot. Right? So why is it not reliable? Later on, once he's dead, we have this unit measurement anymore? It's buried in the ground, or he's cremated. So these first two units are not reliable at all. Everybody agree with that? But in those civilizations in that time, it made sense. Because it was a standard across the board. It was a standard. I know. Ridiculous, but it was a standard. Now, the third value actually does make sense. Okay? And by the way, SI comes from French. It comes from French, the words SI. This is the international. Yeah. And the French really are some of the founding, the founding culture of modern physics, what we use for regular numbers across the board. So the kilogram, which is a certain size of a meter or a piece of rock, I think it's plutonium it was for a long time, is held in France in a museum. And it's physically measured there, and it's held in a vacuum chamber. But the kilogram, it turned out, was a bit radioactive, the sample they used. Over time, the mass has been changing. So they had to reestablish the kilogram. I'll put that on news for them this weekend if you want to take a look at it. There's an article about it. Anyway, let's just put the thought. So the French Academy of Science in 1783 said, you know what? Even though, even though this is ridiculous, it is consistent. Why is it consistent? Why do I not worry about this being invalid or unreliable? Why is this third one very reliable as a definition? Why do you think it is, George? It's not changing. It's not changing. Hope, not changing. Very good. The distance from the North Pole to the equator better not change. And then we take one ten millionth of that. One ten millionth. Right? Isn't that crazy? One ten millionth. Now, with that said, I just want to give you guys an idea of how history plays a role in different parts of physics. Okay? So there will be times I will step back and do a little bit of a bit of history now. So some values, some values. These are not values you need to memorize at all. But certain things you should be familiar with. For example, how tall is like an average person? Give me a number. Give me numbers. About uh, 10. Five, six. And look at that. Seth, you answered probably the average male height. You probably answered more for an average female height. And it turns out you're both way too high. The average male height is five, seven, five, six. And the average female is like five, one, five, two. For the whole world, not the US. Don't forget though, if you go to like Scandinavia, Russia, people are really tall. If you go to Central America, people are pretty short. So in different parts of the world, people have different body types. So the general average, though, is what we're talking about. So you should have some number sense, right? Some number sense. So when I pick this up, I should be like, it's probably like a quarter pound. Okay, a quarter pound, maybe a half. And I know that because I've lifted a pound a week before, or three pounds before. So when we talk about number sense, that's what I mean. So certain things here, obviously you're not going to know. For example, the distance from the Earth to the nearest large galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, you don't have to know that. You don't have to know that. So certain values don't make much of sense. But other things do make sense. This one you should know. Well, not should know, but if you know, sorry, I shouldn't assume people know sports, but if you know about a football field, there's 100 yards in a football field, and the yard is close to a meter. So they're saying it's close to 100 meters. It's not exact. It's close to 100 meters. 
it's on that order of magnitude, 10 to the second. Uh, and then two meters, about the height of a person. Because one meter is about 3.2 feet. That's a good conversion to keep your mind somewhere. A meter is like 3.2 feet. So we're talking about like, in this case, it'd be a little bit over six feet. So this is grounding to the nearest integer here. It's probably close to like 1.6 meters, okay? And then after that, you got some other ones, like a CD. You guys don't use CDs anymore, but I haven't heard of a CD. And then after that, it just gets kind of ridiculous to me. No one's going to the diameter of the aorta. The aorta is your largest artery, not what's the one? Okay. Arteries away from the heart, veins toward the heart. Uh, what did you say was the meters to the feet right here? It's about 3.2 feet for every meter. And maybe 2 or 3.12. I forget which one. You can even screw over a bit. But it's a little more than 3, is what I'm saying. A little more than 3. And the yard is exactly 3 feet, which is why the meter is a little bit bigger than the yard. Slightly bigger. All right, after that, these are other numbers. We'll go to the next slide. Again, I'm just trying to give you ideas of number sense. You don't need to memorize stuff. You should have some number sense when it comes to realistic things. So here, what things are more realistic? Human, right? Maybe an automobile. Probably not anything beyond that. I don't know the weight of an elephant. I'm going to ask an elephant. Maybe you guys know that. Uh, honeybee, probably too small. And then after that, it's kind of just ridiculous. So really, at this chart, the only ones that are kind of like logical to know would be like these three, maybe? OK. I don't know baseball because it's 150 grams, and it says it on the baseball, 150 grams. That 150 grams is put on about kilograms. Now, what is a kilogram? A kilogram is approximately, okay. it is a thousand grams, I like that. Conversion, though, what's my number sense? Does it's anyone know it? Two, about two pounds. Yeah, it's about 2.2 pounds. Jot that down. Okay, a kilogram is around 2.2 pounds. The only reason I'm giving you these values is because I want you to have number sense. So how much do you think an average human weighs in pounds? How much does an average human weighs? Give me a number. 150. 150. Sounds great. But look at this. 70 times 2 is 140, isn't it? So 70 times 2.2 is right around 150. So when you're using your textbook and you see that a boy has a mass of 30 kilograms, it's not like, oh, that's 30 pounds. That's 30 times 2 with a little bit more, another fifth. So it would be 66 pounds is 30 kilograms. Follow what I'm doing there? Okay. So a number of sense to have. Automobile. Automobile, when I was a kid, I was taught that an automobile was like a ton. And the word a ton was used very, very liberally when you were when I was a kid. Oh, there's a ton of food here. There's a ton of this. But what is a ton actually? Anybody know what a ton is? Two thousand pounds. So if it says twelve hundred kilograms, that would probably be what? Twenty-four hundred, a fifth of that would be two hundred, two hundred and forty. So that would be 2640 pounds. So this would be 2640 pounds. And I used to think it was around a ton for a car, which is around 2010. So you have a number of cents of what's going on. Okay, but the conversion that you want to know here is a kilo is around 2.2 pounds. Kilo is very common to use when people talk about kilogram. So when I say kilo, I mean a kilometer, I mean a kilogram. Just like another phrase that's very, many jumps in damage, you don't use it. Also. So if you just see a kilo, it means a mass unit or kilogram. If you see something that says like a micron, a micron is a micrometer, and that's going to come up to play a role down here with this prefix in this table. Okay, when we get to that prefix, a micron is a short way of saying a micrometer. Not a millimeter, not a centimeter, not a decimeter or a decimeter, but a micrometer is used as a phrase as micron. Um, why did the like, the metric system is all like 10, 20, 30. Yeah. Like, I, I use the American system, but why is it like... Oh, why does it suck? Yeah. Because we suck. No. no. Because it was started by some British people a long time ago, and then the British said, well, this is dumb, we shouldn't really use this. They stopped using it. But because we were colonists from the British, we continued using it. And then because we've been stubborn for 300 years, we still use it. Got it. Things should be completely different. You should never be saying temperature in Fahrenheit. It should be in Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Your mass should be in kilo. It doesn't make sense, the other units. Everything is power of twos, in the, in the, and not even everything, I shouldn't say that. Only volume is really power of twos. You have the cup, double the cup, you get the pint, double the pint, you get the quart, four quarts is a gallon. Like, wh what? Why is it double and then multiplied by four? Why are there 12 inches and a foot? You know what I mean? Yeah. So the US system makes no sense. The SI system makes perfect sense because of the power of 10. So to answer your question, I think it's a stubbornness at this point. But over time, we've just adopted it because we were colonists from the British. All right, anyway, so my prefix, 
Say again? Yeah, you know, it is kind of weird. You would think that you would want to get away from the system that was sort of from a lot of our words, like flavor, rich people put you in flavor. Yeah, and color. color yeah. yeah, absolutely. But for math and science, we thought, oh, let's just make it more complicated. All right, out of this table, here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. I'm going to circle the ones that are useful in physics, or I'll put an asterisk. Mega, kilo, centi, milli, micro, and nano. Okay? The other ones are there. I don't want you to bog yourself down on the other ones. You're not going to have to memorize these for tomorrow, but I'm telling you this, that throughout the year, we will definitely use these and they will need to be memorized. But it doesn't need to be done by next week. As you use them more, you'll get accustomed to knowing what the numbers mean. Now, what am I getting at here? Let's discuss. So, first, these are all prefixes. So these alter a number by multiplying by some power of 10. So if I have a millimeter, it's like a meter times this number. If I have a centimeter, it's like a, a meter times this number. If I have a kilometer, what's a kilometer? How many meters? A thousand. Well, what's 10 to the third? Yeah, it's a thousand. Three zeros, right? That's how you know the number zeros. A thousand, three zeros, the number three. A kilometer is a thousand meters. So a kilometer is a meter times that number. A megameter is a meter times that number. Actually, put an asterisk next to giga also, and the reason I'm going to say that is because when it comes to computer science, gigabytes, gigabytes very good. Even terabytes are used nowadays because we have such large storage capacity. But the nice piece about these, take a look. Notice a trend? There's a trend. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, notice that? We really don't care about the units in between multiples of three as an exponent. So these units, okay, deca. We don't use that ever. Hecto, we never use that. So after that, it's like 10 to the third, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the ninth, 10 to the twelfth, 10 to the fifteenth. Notice they're going up by three, the exponent each time. So if you could remember from a computer that it goes kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, you could just, as long as you remember kilo is 10 to the third, you could just consecutively add three to the exponent and get the other ones. So you really don't need to memorize these three as much if you can remember that kilo is 10 to the third, and then the next ones go up by three, as long as you know your computer data storage. But if you're not big on computers, you don't know megabytes are bigger than kilobytes, probably not a good idea to do that. Um, so again, this is one of the few, when it's a micrometer, that is called a micron. Okay, and the other one I said for kilogram is sometimes called a kilo. Okay, and again, I, put, I should put quotes around them because it's not technically the right phrase, but is used so much that you should probably get used to it. A micrometer, the symbol is called mu. We'll talk about it later in the year when we get friction. A micrometer is micron. A kilogram is really a kilo. Shorthand or short word for it. Questions on prefixes. We're going to use them in a moment. We're going to use them in a moment. How about scientific notation? Scientific notation is exactly this. You know what? All we want is one value or one numerical value to the left, or one digit, I should say, one digit to the left of the decimal spot. That's what scientific notation is. That's all it is. Okay? Nothing more than that. Just putting one digit to the left of the decimal. So let's take a look at some examples of all the stuff we've been going through. So scientific notation, part A, what would it be? And scientific notation, what would part A look like? What would part A look like, George? Um, 5.4 times 10 to the um, 5. Now, if I'm going to write in scientific notation, it would be 5.47. So if I'm going to use 10, what should it be? Um, 10 to the 4. So. I'm talking about the decimal? Oh, sorry, 5.5. Yeah. So if I'm going to use scientific notation, I'm getting rid of a little bit of accuracy. I need to round something here as 10 and then round up. Okay? Why is it 10 to the 5? Somebody else. Why is it 10 to the 5th as my power here? Regina? Very good. Whoops. And I almost screwed that up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? 5 spots to the left. Now, some people have a problem remembering whether the exponent should say 5 or negative 5. Here's what I think about it, right? This number. So if something with a positive exponent means it gets, and look at my numbers, is it bigger? So the answer was right. 
Does that make sense? Some teachers teach, oh, if you move the decimal to the left, this is positive. That's fine. And then we're going to move this decimal to the right, which will make the next one negative. But why memorize? I don't like to memorize. If I have to, I will. My memory sucks. When I was in high school, I hated biology. We call it, could it memorize things? You guys know from bio, it's a lot of memorization in bio. Physics I love because I understood it, the theory. I don't memorize this at all. I never memorize left to right because what will happen on one? Unlucky on one test, what do you do? You'll switch it accidentally. And then it's just a lost points for no reason. How about part B? Part B. What would that answer be? Juliet, go ahead. 10 in the negative. Thank you. Let's take a look. One decimal, two decimals, three decimals, four decimal spots to get it there. I agree. And again, 4.8 times 10 to a negative number gets smaller. And that means the answer up here is smaller. So we, val we validate that our answer is correct. Yes, Jack. For example, in the A, if it asked it in centimeters, you would have to do 10 to the 6 or 7. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start to convert from centimeters back to meters. And we're going to do that with dimensional analysis. Yep, absolutely. We want to go to the base unit there. Yep. Let's quickly do this because I want you to practice this over the weekend. I know the bell's going to ring momentarily. So I just want to quickly talk about conversions. First, anybody know where these places are? Hawaii. And they have two different units. Why? You know why? Because people from like Asia might come over and join that. Absolutely. Hawaii has Hawaii is not like a regular continental US where we're always using feet. So when you go near the border in Canada, or when you go to Hawaii, or certain states that might be close to other countries, there's a tendency to see the units in kilometers and meters, and the speed, up, the speed limit as well. If you get near the Canadian border, you see kilometers per hour. Right. Yeah, angled ramp where the cart is moving. All right, so for today, we left off last class with this idea of units and scientific notation. So we already discussed scientific notation, and now we're getting a little bit into conversion of units. Some people call this dimensional analysis. That's another word for it, or another phrase for it. Um, we're going to talk about dimensional consistency in a little while also, which is similar in nature to this. So this is really just about conversions. And there are certain ways to convert mentally, and that's fine. And if it's a simple conversion like, oh, six inches, well, that's a half a foot. There's no reason to do the math for that, right? You can do it in your head. Or if you said, like, you know, three kilometers, and you know kilometers a 1,000 meters, that's 3,000 meters. So certain conversions throughout the year, you should absolutely do in your head. But when it comes to other conversions, it makes sense to have a methodology or a, a procedure to take. The first one here isn't too difficult. It's a two-step conversion, but it's not difficult. In a moment, we're going to talk about one where it's square unit conversion or cubic unit conversion. And those get a little more tricky. You can't just quickly do it in your head. Well, depending on who you are and depending on what the problem says, actually. But I want to show you the procedure so that when in doubt, you can use this procedure at any time. So we're going to convert 270 inches into yards. And notice that I gave you conversion factors. Now, there are some conversion factors that you just got to know. You just have to know. And even if you take, like, so say at the end of this year, you want to take the SAT subject test in physics. They're going to be assuming that you know that there's 12 inches in a foot. Now, most units are going to be SI units, so it won't matter for the most part. But when they do bring up common English units, the assumption will be that you know certain uh, conversions. So I gave you 12 inches in a foot and 3 feet or a yard. Um, but again, like on a test, I probably wouldn't give you those pieces of info right there. Now, would I tell you on a test that 1 inch is approximately 2.54 centimeters? Probably. Because I don't expect you to memorize that, it's 2.54, okay? But 3 to 1 and 12 to 1 is a pretty easy ratio to recognize. Now, here, do we have a meter stick or do we have a yard stick? Do we have a meter stick or do we have a yard stick? Yard. Yard? Yeah. Here. What would a yard be? How many inches? 36. And how many inches is this? Or anybody who knows. A yard would be 36 inches. So this is a meter stick. I didn't show this out. It's 100 centimeters, right? A meter stick. So you can see that a meter is slightly larger than a yard. I want you guys to have number sense. Remember we talk about number sense? You got to know what things physically look or feel like. So when I talk about distances and lengths, 
you should be able to recognize that this is about a yard right here. And then there's your computer, the full length. All right. With that said, let's show the methodology we're going to use. So to start any of these problems, you start by listing the given. So the given is 270 inches. Now, we want to take that value and convert that eventually into yards. So at the end over here, I'm going to have some answer, and my unit are going to be yards. I know that already. I happen to know that it's going to be two conversions, so I left enough space for it to happen. So what I want to do is I want to multiply by a conversion factor. And the whole idea in this process, and this is probably the most important part, is that every conversion factor that you use is really equivalent to one. Think about common denominators in math. If I wanted a common denominator, I have to multiply the numerator and denominator by, like, say, 4 over 4, right, so that I get a common denominator. But I always multiply by the value 1. Let me refer, show you what I'm referring to here on the bottom. So if I had 3 fourths plus 5 thirds, and I wanted to add those fractions, I would multiply 5 thirds by 4 over 4 to make the common denominator 12 there and multiply this by 3 over 3. But whenever I do this in math, I always recognize that when I multiply by a conversion or by a new number, it's really 1. 3 over 3 is 1. 4 over 4 is really 1. And why am I always multiplying by 1? Because you're not changing the value, you're just changing the denominator. Yeah, you're changing the way this fraction is expressed. You're not changing its value, though. The same thing is happening up here. So it's really important that you see that this is really just 3 over 3 is 1 because it's going to show up now. So I'm in inches. But I don't want to be in inches. And let's assume I don't know how many inches in a yard. Assume I don't know how many inches in a yard. You clearly know based on a second ago, right? So if I don't know how many inches are in a yard, I need to go from inches to feet first, and then from feet to yards. So again, the first conversion factor, I want to go from inches to feet. I'm in inches, and I want to get rid of inches. So I put inches in the denominator. And the target unit, the unit I want to get to, I put in the numerator. Now, notice I didn't put any numbers. I always put my units first. Trust me on this. It will help you down the road. Put your units first. Because then you just fill in the numbers that are equivalent. How many feet are in an inch? Or how many inches are in a foot? You always ask yourself that question. How many feet are in an inch? Or how many inches are in a foot? And which way would I go in that direction again? Yeah, 1 over 12. Again, the reason I say to put the units first is because, yes, 1 foot and 12 inches are pretty simple. But later on, when they're a little more complicated, you want to make sure that you put the 1 and the 12 in the right spot. I can't tell you how many students put 12 over 1 accidentally with this. Or they recognize that they, or they use the reciprocal in general for these conversion factors and what they should be. Why am I putting inches in the bottom for my conversion factor? A lot of hands. Awesome. Jackie, what are you thinking? Good. Inches cancel out very much like variables cancel out. If it was x times 1 over x, like this, my x's would cancel out. And it would leave me just with a 1. The same thing is happening with my conversion. By the way, the stuff down here is obviously not a physics problem, but it is math related. So you see I put side notes a lot. Now, I'm in feet at this point because I've gotten rid of inches. I'm currently in feet, but I want to get rid of feet. And I want to get to yards. So what should my next conversion factor state? One yard over three feet. So again, yep, I want to get rid of feet. I want to get to yards. And it's one yard for every three feet. And then the number of feet cancel with feet. And my final unit is yards. So it turns out to convert 270 inches into yards, you could just divide by 36. And that could be something you do in your head. You do not need to do this kind of a problem on a test showing all the work. Now, I will tell you right now, it would never be this easy. If I simply say to you, prove on the first test, for example, convert the following thing and then use it in a problem, it's never going to be something as simple as this. Okay? So I want to step you through an easy example to see it, and then we're going to get to a more complicated one in a moment. So take 270 times 1 times 1 over the product of 12 and 3, which is 36. 270 over 36. 7 and a half. Thank you. 7.5 yards. I'm going to rely upon you guys a lot to do my calculations for me. And I say that because I want you to practice. So I really do expect, and you don't have that now, but I expect calculators every day. Now, today we're not going to get too much math, but going forward, every day, graphing calculator on your desk, not iPad calculator. 
not, 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 not iPad calculator. And the reason I push this is because so many students in the past, and I noticed this, have gotten so used to things like Desmos, which is great, but can you use Desmos on a test? You can't. And then suddenly students can't graph for their life on a calculator. Or they don't know how to put a negative quantity into the calculator. So I recommend that, if, and if you don't have it today, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. But I recommend that every day you have your graphing calculator with you and you use it. Even if it's just simple arithmetic operations. Even if it's just, you know, cubing a decimal value that you can't do in your head. Have it with you so you get used to using it. Because that's all you're going to use on your AP test. You can't use calculator on the SAT subject test, by the way, for physics, but all the numbers are nice. So numbers are always going to be round numbers. And like gravity, which we're going to see later, is 9.81 on the physics test. They call it 10. They round. Because they don't allow students to use calculators on the subject test for physics, the subject test. Keep that in your mind if you're going to take it at the end of the year. Um, so anyhow, have your calculator, please. So 7 1⁄2 yards is 270 inches. Okay, 7 1⁄2 yards. So one thing you can start to recognize, like I said, is you can either go to your direct conversion factor of 36. 270 over 36, because again, 36 inches is one yard. Okay, so that's why you can jump right to 36 there. A very simple example just to illustrate the procedure that you should take. Let's get an example in. So we want to convert 36 kilometers into centimeters. Into centimeters. Now, I'm going to be honest. I don't memorize that whole king something something something. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right? Where you can memorize all the different prefixes and know how many decimal spots to move it. I think it's a bit crazy to do that and know, know all of them. So what I do is I like to take the conversion that I do know. So in this process here, I see that I'm in kilometers and I want to get to centimeters, but I don't know the conversion between kilometers and centimeters. But I know kilometers to meters and then I know meters to centimeters. Does that make sense? So I would partition this problem, or I would truncate it into part A and part B. So I need two conversion factors once again. Want to give me a little more input on that? Um, you, uh, I saw a, a previous problem. You did like the times 1 over 12 times 1 over 3. Would it be easier to, because if, if you know a kilometer is bigger than a centimeter, then you, you know you have to multiply it. But if it said 36 centimeters to kilometers, you know you have to divide it. So it you You're saying centimeters and kilometers, so. Oh. So in the, 0 .000. Yeah, so it depends on which way you prefer. So to be honest, I know that there's 100 centimeters in a meter. Because okay. centi means 100, so I know there's 100 of them. I know that there's 1,000 kilometers in a meter. But, I'm oh, sorry, 1,000 meters in a kilometer. But depending upon your, your knowledge of those values, you might want to use those numbers, or you might want to use the decimal values that are given in the prefix table. But that's kind of up to you to decide which one. I'm going to show you the methodology I'll use here, but you can absolutely do it with decimal values instead of the integer values. Yep. Yeah? And I can show both, actually. So let's start with 36 kilometers. Now, I'm going to get rid of kilometers and put it into meters. So I do that to start right away. Kilometers are gone, but I need to write my conversion. There's 1,000 meters in one kilometer. Now, I'm doing it one way first where I happen to know the numbers. Then I'll use the prefixes from the previous table in the second methodology. I'm now in meters. I want to get rid of meters. I want to go to centimeters. I know that there are 100 centimeters in one meter. And then meters are going to cancel with meters. So this is the way I would approach this problem to start. And then I would get a result. And it's going to be a very large number, clearly, right? We're multiplying by 1,000, and then we're multiplying by 100. So we have 36,000 technically, right, times another 100, which is two more zeros. So is it 3.6 million, right? So we have 3.6 million centimeters. Now before I get to the second method, can we write that in scientific notation? Absolutely, and I probably would. I probably would. So this is 3.6 times 10 to the what? Everybody, yep. Yeah? Six, good. I heard six from a couple of you. Number six, because it's 3.6 million, and a million is 10 to the six, right? We know that we're going to move this six spots over. So that's one way of approaching this problem. Let's take a look at the second way that Jack was mentioning. So if I have 36 kilometers, ready? Now, when I put kilometer and meter here, let's talk about this for a second. I could also use the prefix table that was listed if you go a couple slides back. So feel free to swipe up to see what I'm referring to right now. 
I put a prefix table earlier on, and kilo, kilo in the prefix table means what value? 10 to the what power in the prefix table? Kilo means 10 to the what, Carolyn? Third power. So technically, I could do this. Now, it's the same thing as above, right? Because isn't 1,000 also 10 to the third? So this really hasn't changed much, but I'm expressing it in powers of 10. Kilo is 10 to the third, so I'm, instead of putting 1,000, putting 10 to the third. So that doesn't look like I've changed much, and I really haven't. Let's cancel the, conver or cancel the units. And then I want to get rid of meter and go to centimeter. Now for this, though, for this, my conversion from the conversion table with all those prefixes, if you swipe up again, would tell me that a centi is what? What is a centi equal to? Uh, 10 to the negative 7. Yeah, 10 to the negative 2. So 1, ready? Watch what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, I want you to see this, right? Remember we talked about verbal representations, all different representations. The verbal representation, 1 centimeter. Centi, though, physically means 10 to the negative 2. So by putting 10 to the negative 2 in the bottom now, I physically read this as centimeter. I know that sounds weird, but think about it. This means the prefix centi, C-E-N-T-I. Centimeter, one centimeter. So these are equivalent to each other because I'm physically in my mind reading this as the prefix centi. And centimeter is the same as centimeter. Those would be the value of one, canceling those units. Now, you might look at this and say, oh, this is different than this is. But it's not. It's the same thing. 10 squared is what? What's 10 squared in general? Thank you, 100. So 10 to the negative 2, remember when you have a negative exponent, what do you do with it really? You bring it up to the numerator and make it what? Positive. So this up to the numerator would make it 10 squared up here. Well, that's 10 squared right there. So this is the same thing. You'll get the exact same answer either way, but I want to show you that in case you don't know your number sense yet, in case you don't know that there's 100 centimeters in a meter, or that there's 1,000 meters in a kilometer, you can memorize your prefixes from the prefix table and use this second method. Okay? So depending upon the confidence you have in knowing your values, you can either use this, or you can say, I'm not really confident, I don't know these numbers, and therefore memorize all of the prefixes that I recommended, which were, if you recall, micro, milli, centi, kilo, mega, giga. Is that correct? Those are the ones that you guys all put asterisks next to? Okay, those are the ones you'd have to memorize. So again, giving you the same answer. I don't have to go through the math here. You get the exact same answer. Take a look at the next example now. Now we have a mixed unit. A mixed unit. What does 25 kilometers per hour actually mean? I know it's ridiculous to say, right? Why am I asking this? But what does it mean? I mean, there's a reason I'm asking this. Christina? Very good. You will have traveled 25 kilometers for every hour. So although that sounds seemingly simple, it will help us with our unit analysis. So we start by writing 25 kilometers for every one hour. So this is how I do a unit analysis if I have units that have fractions in them. So meters per second, miles per hour, gallons per minute, gasoline flow rate, uh, liters per second, the rate at which the water flows out of the faucet, or the rate at which the air conditioner pumps in gas in liters per minute, or in cubic meters per minute, whatever units they may be. When the units have fractions involved, I absolutely write it this way. And I know it sounds trivial, but it will help. So my goal, though, is to get to meters per second. So I got to get rid of kilometers and put that into meters. I got to get rid of hours and convert that down to seconds. So I have multiple conversions to do here. So I recommend the methodology we just took. So I want to get rid of kilometers. It's in the numerator. So where should I put kilometer if it's in the numerator and I want to get rid of it? In the denominator. And my goal is to get to meters. I know, again, that there's 1,000 meters in a kilometer. My unit of kilometers are gone. I then ask myself, OK, I'm done with my distance portion of the conversion, but my time has not been converted yet. So I need to get rid of hours and get that into seconds. Now, what would I do for a conversion factor for this part? What are you thinking, Moro? One hour over 60 minutes. 
One hour over 60 minutes, that works, because we want to get rid of hour, and since hour is in the bottom, it'll cancel with the top, and one hour is indeed 60 minutes, and we're always taking the approach where he's converting to minutes first, and then after that into seconds, which is fine. If you know how many seconds are in an hour, you can convert directly also, but not everybody memorizes that number. What is that number though, in case you're wondering? 3,600 or 3,600, and we'll see where that comes from in a moment. So how do I get rid of minutes now? Now I'm in minutes in the bottom, but I want to be in seconds, not minutes. How do I get rid of minutes, Christina? You multiply by one minute over 60 seconds. Yeah, minute over seconds, and one minute is 60 seconds, and then my minutes cancel. So notice 3,600 was the number that a couple of you just stated. Well, here it is. 60 times 60 is 3,600. So you could have put one hour over 3,600 seconds and completely ignored the middle change. Okay, but when in doubt, definitely show all the conversions if you're not certain about a direct conversion factor. Okay? So as a result, what do we get? 25 times 1,000 is 25,000 over 3,600. I can drop off two of my zeros. So it becomes 250 over 36 meters per second. What is that approximately? Seven, eight, something? Seven. <laughs> Around seven? <coughs> Give me a nearest tenth, six point what? Okay. So when we look at these problems, we want to recognize that when we want to get rid of a unit, put it in the opposing position. If the unit is in the numerator, that unit needs to be put in the denominator to cancel. If the unit is in the denominator, such as hours was, we put hours in the numerator to cancel it. Then we had a minute in the denominator, so we put minute in the numerator to cancel that portion. Okay, any questions on the first couple exchanges or the first couple conversions? Yeah? Um, for this problem, could you separate on kilometers and hours, like you deal with each one separately? You could, George, but. Honestly, it's less efficient and it probably will cause issues down the road. So, and I'll show you why in a moment. If you have units that are more complex, like cubic meters per second. So I would recommend using this method, okay? I would recommend it. It'll just, it also just save you time, okay? All right, so for the next one, we're gonna see now where it's a little bit trickier. So with the person next to you, I want you to try to think about how you would figure this out. It's not the same approach, I mean, it's the same general idea, but it's not the same answer and the same methodology we use exactly. So look at the person next to you and discuss what you might do for a problem like this. Spend about a minute to two just discussing the idea, please. Alright, let's talk. Who thinks they know what we do here? 
What do we do with a square unit is the question, right? That's really the question at, at hand here. What do we do with a square unit? What are we thinking? What are we thinking? Give me some ideas. Valentina? Um, you can square the factor or you can do the radical of the initial. Okay, I like the idea. And I would, I would go with the first approach. It's a lot, I think, simpler. So what Valentina noticed is this. She's trying to convert 900 square feet. So let's start with that. And that's my value. And you could start by saying, okay, well, let's convert feet down to inches, and then let's convert inches down to centimeters, right? So we could say, all right, here's feet here, and this is inches. There's 12 inches and a foot. But if I convert, or if I leave it like that, I'm not getting rid of the square feet, I'm only getting rid of feet, right? So I need to square the entire conversion factor. And then again, the next part, once I cancel feet, because now square feet are gone, again, because this is square, this will be square feet, this is going to be square inches. I then want to convert that down into centimeters. And again, we have to convert that to centimeters and then go after that into meters, right? So you'll notice there are three conversion factors here, and all of them need to be squared. Because all the units we're canceling are square units. It's area. If it were volume, what would the units be? Cubed, and your conversion factors would therefore have to be cubed. Uh, Jack, you had a hand, yeah. Is there a scale, scale factor, not a formula, but like you multiply it by k, so k is either to the power of 2 or the power of 3. Power of yeah, you could figure out a scale factor for this, and you could say, all right, well, it's really just going to be 12 times 2.54. Because like, you know it's squared feet. You multiply by k squared, k equals 12, so you multiply it by you can absolutely do that. Yep, 144 is the, ver is, is the same thing as putting 12 squared, though. So what I'm saying, though, is you could also, Jack, multiply all your conversion factors first and then square that. Okay. It's no, right? Think about the order of operations here. It makes no difference. Whether you do 12 times 12 and then the next one, which is going to be 2.54 centimeters for every one inch, inches cancel provided I square the conversion factor. So I could do 12 times 2.54 times the next one, and then square that, or just square them all separately. I'm showing the squaring separately so the units make sense, okay? But you can absolutely do that. So then the last part is I want to get rid of centimeters, and I want to get into meters. So I do that. How many meters in a centimeter? How many centimeters in a meter? What do we got? Which way? Christina? Yeah, and again, if you know that value, I would take that approach. If you don't have that memorized yet, then you probably would have to say, oh, 10 to the negative 2 meters for every 1 centimeter. That works, but then you just got to memorize those prefixes. Whereas personally, I just think about a meter stick. All right? This is a meter stick right here. And what's the marking on here? Centimeters. How many are there? 100. How many millimeters are there on here? How many millimeters are there? Louder? 1,000. 1,000. Okay. There are 10 millimeters. For every centimeters, so there are 10 of them here, but there are 10 of them 100 times. Which is 1,000. 1,000 millimeters in the year. So again, I know it sounds super like, like simple, but you should know those values at some point. Okay, whether it's at the end of this course this year, or whether it's, you know, sooner on the first test, maybe. It'd be nice to know. Now, at this point, we have to just go through the process. So it's going to be 900 times 12 squared times 2.54 squared divided by 100 squared. Remember, the ones don't do anything, right? You notice that? The ones are just placeholders for all those other values. So my final answer is going to be 900 times 144 times, I don't know what 2.54 squared is, all over, this is going to be what? 10,000 above? Okay? So I squared the 12 and I squared the 100, but I don't know what 2.54 squared is as a decimal, so I'm not doing that in my head. What do we get? What do we get? What do we get? Go ahead, Valentina. What do we got? 83.6. Now, let's use common sense. Let's use common sense. How do we know that answer is sane? Like all these sanity checks, by the way. Sanity checks. Right? Like your mass of an object, like a calculator, is not going to be 10,000 kilograms, right? Your answer is insane. What is the sanity check portion here? Help me out, yeah? Well, because you know that um, a meter is slightly larger than a yard, and you have the original one in your feet. You would just divide the original one um, by three, which would be like about, okay. 
square, by three squared, sorry. Yep. Um, Which would get you down to about what? What, 100. And, and what another? 326 is pretty So you see what she's saying? She's saying, well, you know what? There's three, uh, three feet in the yard, so the conversion to yards or square yards would be, okay, I want to convert by dividing by three, but since it's square feet, we divide by three squared. So 900 divided by nine would give us around 100, and it's around that answer. What's another sanity check for this problem? What's another way you can just be like, oh, it makes sense at least. Yeah? Well, you know feet are smaller than yards, and if feet are smaller and there's more of them, then you should have less meters. Exactly. Than feet are smaller than meters, so yards, but oh. smaller than meters. So your number's got to go down here, right? Just think about it. What is a square foot? A square foot is literally 12 by 12. It's this much area. Everybody see that? That's one square foot. One square meter is taking a meter stick by a meter stick. It's far larger. So if you have this classroom, and this were, say, 50 square feet, I don't know what the square footage is in this house, it's way more than that. Say, we're, say a room were 50 square feet, you're not going to have many meters in that 50 square feet. So your number had to go down. Do you make a comment? Oh, yeah. Um, I originally did it this way, but then I thought, maybe just this problem, but wouldn't it be easier just to square that? And then at the end, you square your final answer. That works out, Tina. See what she's saying? If a room is 900 square feet, it means it's 30 by 30, right? Mm -hmm. Approximately. It might not be. It could be 450 by 2. Right? Imagine that would be really narrow hallway, 450 feet long by 2 feet wide. But 900 square feet would be 30 by 30. So she said, let me take the square root, make it 30 by 30, convert that into meters, and then if we know the length of the side of the room, we can then square that through that. That works also. Again, that's why physics is so cool. You can do it as many ways and get the same answer, right? So again, she's saying this, because I see a lot of confused looks. This is 30 feet by 30 feet, right? That's what 900 square feet is, a room like that. So she just said in her mind, convert this into meters, convert this into meters, and then multiply those two numbers, and you'll get back to this answer. That works, absolutely works, good idea. Okay, again, I'm gonna use this phrase a lot. It's six and one half dozen. It's six and one half dozen. Have you heard that before? It makes sense, right? What's a half a dozen is six. Meaning, like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's the same method, it's the same answer with different methodology. But you're going to recognize that in physics, you can take that approach for a lot of problems. All right, very good. So let's use this idea now of estimations. And we're going to do some estimations using what are called known units. And what I mean by known units are, I mean, like, things that are everyday values. Everyday values. So, estimations. If I were to ask you, and these are problems like, and these are ridiculous questions, but they're asked all the time. And if you ever want to work for a company like Google or one of these like cutting edge engineering firms, they're going to ask you questions in an interview that are stupid, ridiculous, but they make sense when they ask you. They'll say something like this. How many ping pong balls can fit in a school bus? On an interview, those on the spot ask you that. And right at, work, at first you're like, well, how am I going to figure that out, right? That's overwhelming. How many ping pong balls can fit in a school bus? Like, that's crazy. That's really crazy. But if you break it down, you can actually estimate, and it's all the, what the interviewer wants to see is the methodology you take to get to the answer. Whether it's exactly right or not is not what they're looking for. So what would you say to yourself? Okay, a ping pong ball, well, that's about an inch in diameter, and a bus across, let's see, a school bus, let's say it's the, Large, regular school bus, large. <coughs> school bus across might be two of my, so probably like 10 feet across, and they're about an inch. So I can fit 12 in a foot, so I can fit 120 ping pong balls this way. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Then, if I can figure out how many ping pong balls I can fit this way, and this way, I can multiply those three dimensions to get the amount of ping pong balls. So like, it's ridiculous to think that that would be a question, but using what are called known units. So knowing or estimating what the diameter of a ping pong ball is the key. And then also estimating how wide is a bus, how tall is the bus, how long is the bus. Those three numbers multiplied length times width times height gives you volume. So if you know 120 ping pong balls fit this way and 2,000 fit that way and you could stack them 10 high, it's 120 times 2,000 times 10. That's how many ping pong balls you would fit in a crazy matrix going through that school bus. You would never do this, right? But that's the idea of estimations. So let's take a look at an example that is somewhat more reasonable than what we just did. So estimate the thickness of a sheet of paper. A sheet of paper. Thoughts. Thoughts. 
Remember, the key is using what we call known values. Known values. So think about, think about the possible... Actually, no. Think about how you can physically get an idea of thickness of paper if you can't use one sheet. Because one sheet is impossible to figure out, right? Can anyone honestly be like, oh, one sheet of paper, that's like uh, know, half a millimeter. Like, no one's going to be able to figure that out. So we clearly can't use one sheet of paper, obviously. So with that knowledge, what do you think you can do? If you can't use one sheet of paper, what could you possibly utilize instead? George, what do you think? About like, how big 100 sheets are. Perfect. I like that, George. Now, George said 100 sheets. Is there a known thickness of 100 sheets? We have to estimate it, right? But what do you use all the time when you load a printer? How much paper do you usually load into the printer? What do you open up to load a printer? Do you guys load printers ever? I feel like I'm doing that all the time. I don't know, you should send like 100 sheets. Yeah, and you think it's about this big, right? But do you know that it's 100 sheets? Do you have any idea, really? The pack says 100 sheets. Oh, okay, so stop. You find packs that have 100 sheets in them? Yeah. I've never seen that before, ever. What is the classic? I'm, I'm not being honest. I'm not like messing with you. No, no, we have no. a high of See, nobody even knows. What is it? A ream of paper is 500. Sorry. Anybody watch The Office? Yeah. <laughs> you would know that if you watch The Office. Okay. So I would use the 500 because, because I know I've seen a ream of paper before. I can grab one from next door if you want to see it. A ream of paper is about this thick, and I know there's 500 sheets. So 100 works if you know the thickness or you have an idea of the thickness. But again, this is an estimation. So it's the process you take that's important, not necessarily the exact answer itself. Now, if you're way off and you're like, oh, a ream of paper is 500 sheets and that's two meters. That's not two meters, like it's not even close, right? This might be like four centimeters, this thickness. So if your estimation is off because your conversion is like totally wrong or your known value is not right, then obviously it's not gonna be an appropriate answer. But if you say that a ream of paper is three centimeters and Julia says three and a half, Right? Am I going to really care much? No. It's the idea that you understand the conversion factor. So in this case, I would happen to use a ream of paper because it's a little bit easier because I know the thickness, or I, I can estimate the thickness. So in this problem, we could say 500 sheets for every what? What should we use as a value? Inches or centimeters, whatever you like. I'd say like two inches. Two inches? Okay, that works. So 500 sheets for every two inches. So I want to know how many inches or centimeters are there per sheet. So what should I do with this value I just wrote on the board? What should I do with it, Seb? Divide it. Yeah, but should I divide the way it's shown? What should I do, Seb? Yeah, notice that? I wrote the convert or I wrote the number up like this, and then I asked myself, well, what am I doing? I'm trying to figure out the number of inches for every one sheet. So I said and recognized it's really the reciprocal of this number that we care about. Because I want to know, again, the thickness of a sheet of paper. So my answer should be in inches per sheet. How many inches are there in one sheet? Now it's gonna be a very small number, isn't it? Very small number, which makes sense when it's two over five hundred or one over 250. So one 250th inches per sheet. I'm writing per, even though I can write it as a fraction line, because I want you to see that that's the same thing. Inches per sheet is the same thing as inches divided by sheets. So about one 250th of an inch for every sheet of paper. Again, a very a very like a trivial example because obviously if we wanted to actually measure it. Let's see if the cap is open. If we really wanted to measure oh, there it is. a sheet of paper, we can use what's called a micrometer. Calipers and micrometers are tools that measure really, really, really small distances. So if you wanted to measure a sheet of paper literally, you can do it with a micrometer. You put the micrometer outside and you have a fine-tuned device, and it'll be a very, very small value. So this concept of estimation is more of a critical thinking, problem solving utilization. It's not really something you would use to actually come up with a dimension. Does that make sense what I'm saying? The process we're taking though is important.
So you guys can use this idea. This shows up on questions on like SATs or like the GMAT or the GRE for colleges when you go to grad school, the GMAT and the GRE or the LSAT. These kind of questions that are like thinking outside the box and critical thinking, they show up, these ideas. So not just for that reason to use it, but for your guys' minds to grow a little bit. Um, let's take a look at this one. Estimate the number of gallons of water a human will drink in a lifetime. Would your partner next to you go through this, please? Would your partner next to you go through this? Start simple and work your way up. But you're probably going to have different answers. So the number at the end is not what's important right now. It's the methodology that you take. Eduardo, Justin, you guys finished pretty quick. Give me your, give me your insight as to what you would do okay, here. So we converted like gallons per day. Well, really, we just did a, a gallon a day. All right, so let's start. He assumed, big assumption right there. You drink a gallon per day. That's the important part. 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 That's the important part. The important part there is a gallon per day. Before you keep going, what did others assume? Half a gallon per day. Yeah, because it's like a gallon every two seconds. A gallon, half a gallon per day. A gallon? Did anyone use anything besides a gallon or half a gallon per day? Liters. That's probably reasonable. Now, yes, you can convert to liters, absolutely. But this problem happens to say gallons. Only reason I didn't do liters is because I know you have a number set of gallons right now. What is a liter compared to a gallon, though? Ish. About a fourth. Just like a meter is kind of like a yard, a liter is kind of like a quart. Very similar, but not the same value. Vin. Yeah, go for it. So Eduardo said that there is assuming to be one gallon of water drank per day. So that's a good starting point. Continue. Uh, then we... Uh... Did, like, knowing we'll like 365 days per one year. Or, yeah, days per one year. And then we made another assumption. Okay, so here's the other assumption. Here's the other assumption. The average human lives around 80 years. Okay. Per lifetime. Very good. Well done. I, when I did this, because I was trying to really push conversion, I started analysis. And I thought... All right, well, if you drink eight cups of water a day, and there's eight ounces per cup of water, that's 64 ounces, converted 64 ounces into gallons, and kept on, which is kind of what you guys did with the half gallon to start, right? Is a gallon 128? What is it? A gallon is 16, what is it? Gallon? 16. How many ounces? Is it 128 ounces? Gallon to ounces. 128, okay, I thought I knew the number. So. I used ounces because I thought of a cup, and a pint, a pint of water is 16 ounces, and a, a cup of water is 8 ounces. Eight cups of water is the average person would drink per day, around a half a gallon per day. Now, that is the average per, or the, no, sorry, not the average, the suggested value, right? The suggested value is that the average person drinks eight cups per day, or should drink eight cups per day. If you live in a place where it is very warm, you probably drink more. If you live in a place where it's cooler, you probably drink less. If you're active all day, you probably drink more. If you're inactive all day, you probably drink less. You follow what I mean? So obviously there is room for some deviation person to person. Okay, what does this number come out to be out of curiosity? Uh, 29,200 gallons. Now, ready? Number sense. Number sense. <laughs> Any idea what that is pretty much equal to? I know, ridiculous, you would think I would know this, right? And I do this before this class, I promise. Not trying to think. Numbers. And I only knew it because growing up, my dad told me this number. It's ridiculous that I was doing Anybody have a pool in their backyard? You're going to say it? I was going to say it. An in ground pool in a backyard, an average size is between 25 and 30,000 pounds. That's about an in ground average. Again, this will vary dramatically. Olympic sized pools are like 80,000 gallons. 
This is about one pool. That's how much you drink in a lifetime if you drink a gallon per day. So let me show you what I mean with this with the next slide. We want to verify from freshman year math the rate, the rate equation D equals RT. So what could D be measured in? What could D be measured in? Give me a unit D could be measured in. Okay, so let's measure D in meters. I'm going to put brackets. Square brackets in physics usually mean units when you're talking about the dimensional quantities. I'm not plugging in numbers, obviously, for this. I'm just looking at units. So distance or displacement, we'll use both those words in physics, it's different, is represented or measured in meters. What would time be measured in? What would time be measured in, Isabella? Seconds. Seconds. So if I didn't know what rate should be measured in, I could figure it out. Because whatever I put here needs to make the equation the same units on both sides. So what should the rates, units, be measured in so that we have dimensional consistency here. What units should we use? Meters per second. Meters per second. And Morrow said that because what he recognized is this. Well, if this side has meters on it, this side has to have meters. So I need to get rid of these seconds and take a look. Seconds would cancel there, right? Meters per second times the number of seconds, those seconds would cancel just like we did with unit conversions a moment ago. So this equation, D equals RT, is dimensionally consistent. It is dimensionally consistent. Okay, a very simple equation, obviously, because we haven't gotten into much physics yet. But as we get into this course, and you guys can look if you want on your removal page, you'll see I already put two sets of equation sheets, one from the AP1, one from the AP2 exam. We're going to use a lot of the equations on those sheets. And because I know some of you really want to push yourself, you might at the end of this year like say, oh, maybe I'll take the AP1 exam. Maybe you could at the end of this year. The AP1 exam isn't too hard. The AP1 exam is really what we're going to be teaching in this course. Now, this is not considered an AP course, but it's only because I've been taught it before and I would consider an AP course and I would teach it to other people. It's not involved in calculus, it'll be all trig, 
and algebra with physics, and next year you do calculus with physics in what's called ABC. But this year you might consider taking the AP1 exam. If you do, recognize that those formula sheets have a lot, of, a lot of different formulas, but they're all dimensionally consistent. Dimensionally consistent. Okay, that's the last slide for these notes. The next slide didn't have any questions, but I emailed this to you already. My notes will have the questions at the end normally. Again, I'm just working out a new textbook this year, so I haven't picked the assignments yet. So I'm picking them as we go, and I'm trying to make the problems ones that are difficult enough for you to challenge you if you want to consider you know, pushing yourself this year or you know, you're going to take easy physics next year. So this is your assignment. Um, this assignment is due on Thursday. It is not, it looks like a lengthy assignment with question numbers, it is not. This is, these are actually really quick problems compared to what we're going to do as the year progresses. So as the year progresses, you might have like seven homework problems for an assignment, and then they take you a solid hour because the problems might be lengthy. These, although it looks like they're numerous, they're not lengthy. Okay, they're not lengthy. By the way, Q again stands for questions, M stood for like, if you look at page 17, it's called like misconception questions. So this is questions, this is misconception questions, and then from pages 18 to 20, there's no question about it. There's only certain numbers there that you can see. Okay? Uh, where are you going to submit this homework for Thursday? Please Google Drive. If you do hard copy, that's fine. But again, just like the labs, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to ask for things that are due on days. You either put them on your desk, or you put them on my desk, or you physically hand it to me. Okay, but I'm not going to ask for your work. I'm going to assume that everybody's loading into Google Drive, so if you did a hard copy, please turn it into me. Okay? Say, speaking of which, does anyone have that lab that's not turned it in yet? <laughs> Do it today, right? So you should have it out of your desk when you arrive always. Any work that's due on the day of, you should always have it out on your desk. That's really scary. No, no, no. I just wanted to make sure it was the right sheet. Okay. Okay. All right. No one else, right? I got all the labs. If for some reason you did not turn in a lab today, get it in tomorrow. It's 10% off already at this point. If you wait till Thursday, it's now 20% off. You don't want to start with an 80 on labs. Labs are what, 30% of your grade or 25%? It's pretty, it's a big chunk of your grade. I forget the baby in this one. Um, we're going to run out of time, so I might not even turn this out to you yet. I might just start talking about the lab that we're going to work on. Okay, so we have an idea. And then next class, we'll be working on this lab. So this lab that we're going to do is an introductory lab into the idea of rates of change. But what we're going to really do for the first lab is we're going to have a constant rate of change. What do I mean by that? The constant rate of change versus like a varying rate of change. Uh, it means that it continues to change at the same pace throughout the entire time. Good. And give me an example of that, more. Very good. What's an example of something that would continue to change at the same pace? Velocity. Good. So if I were walking across the room like this, this would be a consistent rate of change or a constant rate of change. But if I were to go very slow and take small steps and then get bigger and bigger and bigger and make every step bigger, I would have a varying rate of change. My rate of change in the beginning would be very low. And then my rate of change would continue to increase. That would be accelerated motion. So we're going to look at these two things, constant motion and accelerated motion. And what we're going to do is, we're going to do a lab that's pretty simple for constant motion, and then a lab that's a bit more complicated for accelerated motion. Okay, we're going to see both of those. Um, on Thursday, what I'd like to do, I'd like you to come here, obviously, right away to class, but we're going to go down to the gym on Thursday. It's pretty tough to use the motion detectors in here if you're going to do walking objects or moving objects. Um, we're going to also use the motion detectors with those ramps and carts. Uh, but that works better when we do the acceleration portion of it. The constant velocity portion I think is better when you physically do it yourself. So we're going to meet here next class. We're going to gather our supplies. I'm going to run you through the supplies right now so it's a little easier and saves us time. So these, this is the data acquisition device. And we're going to use this a lot this year so we get used to using it. The interface is very similar. All that changes is the different probe that you plug in depending upon the application. So for Thursday's class, we're going to use these things called motion detectors. Every group will be with a partner. 
probably two per, pro yeah, probably two per, unless I need to do three, but I think we'll be able to get two for each. Uh, every two people will get one of these and one of these. When opened, you'll notice it's neatly packed away. I expect it to be put back the way it's found. Again, not like this kind of stuff. This should not be left all around the room. I don't know who did this last year, not my class, I know that. But you guys clean up after yourselves always. So this will go back in here, it'll be tucked away neatly. This cord connects your lab press by your lab press device to the sensor itself. Now, this portal, I'm um, just gonna have a little bit of time I'm doing this, but I might as well actually do this in the next class. This looks like it might fit inside. It does not. These are called analog ports. On the top, there are digital ports. What you need to do is open up the digital port on the top, and you'll see two more ports exist here. So some of the probes are analog, some are digital, depending upon when they were made, when they were actually inventing them. So the newer ones are digital, so it clips in the top. As soon as you clip this into the top and connect it to the motion detector, the device auto detects. You don't have to set it up, which is very nice. Some older, older devices, which we're going to use this year, don't want to detect. You have to choose what device it is and say, like, oh, it's a motion detector. But for this case, it will auto detect every time. Now, once it starts up, once it starts up, it'll take a second to start up, the screen will look like this. Okay. Now, on the screen, you'll notice along the top, it might be tough to see in the back, along the top, there are a bunch of options. There's an option up here for the actual sensor, and then there's like a graph, a data table, a bunch of different things. In order to press them, I recommend that you take the stylus out of here. It's in the back of the device, right here. Using your finger is very clunky, it doesn't work well on them. The device, though, works really well if you use the stylus. Now, there's a lot that we're gonna talk about, a lot that you can do, but one of the first things I recommend, it will be a sample of five seconds it'll take. Five seconds is not enough time for you to do what we're going to do in the lab. So right off the bat, the first thing you're going to do when we get to this is change the time duration. It's, again, on the side here it says, this one says 10, because I changed it a little while ago, I was just using it. This says 10 seconds. The default to say five seconds. You'll tap the duration and change that to be 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds, so that when you do this experiment trial run, you'll be able to actually complete your walk in the right amount of time. The way these work, by the way, or the way they work really well, is if you move with a, if you move with a constant rate, A, and if you move with some sort of reflective material, the motion detectors themselves send out pulses. Those pulses are measured by your body, and they get rebounded to the motion detector itself. So if the detector is at the podium, it sends a pulse toward me, it hits my body, the pulse gets returned. The detector knows the speed at which the pulse is being sent. I think it uses sound waves, actually. So it uses the speed of sound, I think, actually. So it'd be 330 meters per second. It knows the speed, and it knows how long it took. So every time it takes a calculation, it knows the speed, and it knows how long it took to return, it can measure your distance. And as you move away, it keeps sending pulses. It sends 20 pulses every second. That's the frequency. Let's say samples per second. It's going to send 20 pulses every second. So it's not like you're going to be able to physically see it sending pulses. But when you take your data and you look at your data table, every 0.05 seconds you'll have another reading. Because 0.05 is 120. Again, it takes 20 readings every single second. Now, what we're going to hopefully see are graphs like this, where we have position and time. And position is really your displacement is what it is. Position is your displacement. And if you move away from the detector, you should see displacement changing. If you stand still, you should see displacement being constant. So in the lab, we're going to be able to plot stuff, and then we're going to utilize the concept of slope, if you remember from the summer packet, to discuss velocity, acceleration, etc. Okay? It's not a difficult lab, but it's a nice lab because it introduces you to the motion detector, and it also introduces you to the vernet for near lab press devices. But the actual math involved, not too bad. The next one with acceleration, that'll be a lot of time. Okay? So again, this homework is due Thursday, please. Thursday. If your lab is not here, get to the ASAP. Have a good day, guys. Don't forget all the hours tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we have school. This summer happens.
Make sure you tell them because they'll forget. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll get it.